All right, let's begin um, with a couple moments of silence. First landing in ourselves and then landing together. So taking a nice luxurious sigh and savoring that pause at the out breath. And one more, they're free. And feeling the sensations in your body, like uh, the gentle pressure on your feet. and your bottom and the moment by moment sensations as you breathe that are going on in your torso and i invite you to come back to this whenever you need to tonight through our discussions and the learning. And now through our hearts, which is where our minds sit, we can feel how it's like there's this huge ocean of awareness and everything and everyone is a wave on that ocean. This means that we're all made of ocean. That one awareness. while at the same time, each wave, each of us is unique. So both wave and ocean. And so that one vast mind is expressing itself in these countless ways each of us expressing it in our unique way. And we're all joined together, naturally. As we tune into this, we can feel how we're all joined, all of us on this call, quite naturally joined at the root. And so we tune into that so that we, we can feel how we're truly together. And that's just enhanced by Zoom. We can also feel the weight of the subject at hand. And we feel for all of our fellow waves on the ocean, wanting to do whatever we can for us all. And so we begin. So the first thing I want to do is just share a moment in time when I was 15 years old, which was a very long time ago. I was on a two month camping trip where I was living outside spending all of my time in national parks and climbing mountains and things, sleeping on the ground, <clears throat> falling asleep, looking at the stars. I realized this is my natural habitat. And it was a beautiful experience, life-changing really. And one of the key life-changing aspects to it was when I came home. My parents were living in an apartment high above the earth um, in a city and I looked out on the city 
And I thought, civilization isn't all it's cracked up to be. I looked around and I thought, actually, all of these buildings look to me like a house of cards. And we keep piling more and more cards on top, on top, on top. And it's on a false foundation. What is going to happen except that they all fall down? It's just a question of when, unless we change what we're doing radically. Radical meaning from the root. So at age 15, I went into a real depression, a grieving depression about this. And I didn't dare tell anybody because I thought they're going to think I'm crazy. So I kept it to myself for a long time and only, you know, mentioned to an occasional trusted friend. And then world events unfolded. And now we're at the point where I think all of us are seeing the piling of the last cards that are being done. And um, we can see this is bound to fall down. And as a matter of fact, things are starting to fall apart. And it almost seems like it's speeding up. When I found out from my teacher, Tukusangak Rinpoche, that there had been many prophecies by Guru Rinpoche, who was the master who really converted uh, Tibet to Buddhism. He was invited there by the king who wanted Buddhism established there. So this was not a colonial takeover, <laughs> quite the opposite. He was invited there. And um, so he was a master of transformation and, among other things, transformed Tibet into a Buddhist country. Um, so he made very specific predictions about uh, lineages of teachings that he hid in different places to be revealed at different times by different people. He listed in his predictions the name of the person who would reveal that um, lineage, that treasure, as it's called and where that would happen and so on. He was very specific in many predictions. And so everybody came to just trust that. So then my teacher, Tukusangak Rinpoche, mentioned that Guru Rinpoche had made predictions about these times and that those very specific predictions were starting to come to pass. So he predicted global warming, for example. He predicted SARS and what it would look like under the microscope really very specific things and lots of them. I said, well, you know, can we translate that book? And Rinpoche said, well, actually, there are, you know, some of them here, some of them there, they're like scattered throughout uh, the different lineages and in different books. Well, <clears throat> so then I asked about it more recently because I'm like, uh, you know, these are really starting to come to pass and it would really be good to know what they are. So I asked his brother, um, Namchak Kem Rinpoche, do we have some of these predictions and can we translate them? And he said, well, actually, the lamas are really concerned because the predictions are coming to pass. And this one lama did compile uh, a whole lot of the predictions. So then um, Tukusangak Rinpoche sort of picked some of those predictions and also remedies, uh, what we could do about them, um, into a letter. And we've published that letter on our uh, SIOT website, which uh, you'll get that link. Okay, let me back up. Why is this happening? <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure you've wondered. I've certainly wondered. And the best way I can describe it is that um, it's like there are biorhythms of the mind, of consciousness on the inner levels. So you know about biorhythms as far as your body is concerned. These are just a natural occurrence that continues to happen. Well, it's also true on inner levels, on levels of consciousness. So for example, in the time of the Buddha, he could just say a few things to somebody and they would become enlightened on the spot. You know, they could sit together. People would come become enlightened on the spot. Nowadays, <laughs> it doesn't quite happen that way because we're now in a low ebb, which is what Guru Rinpoche described. He said, these are the negative times. That's how I translate it, du mien in Tibetan. But another important piece of that context is, you know, what's happening in the low ebbs versus the high ones. What's happening is more or less ego attachment, 
seeing things through the lens of, is this good for me or not? And you're going to see things in that way if you're seeing it from the point of view of the tips of the waves instead of the whole ocean. In the time of the Buddha, it was the air was not so thick with ego orientation. And so um, people naturally could see things more from the whole ocean point of view. And that's why it was so much easier for them to step into um, enlightenment. Dharma means truth. And to see things as they really are, um, in a sense, that's, if you can do that to such a deep extent that you pass um, over the line of no return, if you will, that's Buddhahood. And at that point, there is no ego identification. Ego isn't the bad guy. It's sort of like, you know, psychic, um, a, a psychic organ. The question is, is it driving things? Is that the point of view from which we're coming? Are we in an I other sort of orientation? So the more we're in the I other orientation and coming from the point of view of ego, um, the more we're going to make decisions based on a false view, because that's not reality. Reality is the whole ocean, not just the tip of one wave. Um, so I think we know from our own lives that when we don't see things correctly and we act and speak and think out of that wrong point of view, we're going to make a lot of mistakes and we're going to make suffering for ourselves and those around us. <clears throat> so that's what's happening in all kinds of ways, whether it's, um, you know, wanting to get ahead at your job at the expense of somebody else or uh, over consuming or just any of the thousands and millions of things in all of the thousands of little decisions, big decisions we make every day. So um, Guru Rinpoche's remedies have to do with turning around this ego identified point of view that then rolls out into all kinds of harmful actions that lead one to another in a chain reaction until we have things like, um, you know, an environment that's being completely thrown off balance to the point where who knows it, if it's really even going to work at all for human life. Um, to the point where there are more and bigger wars and there could eventually be nuclear war. So these are the kinds of things that 1,200 years ago, Guru Rinpoche predicted, and he also gave remedies. This is a time when it's still on happening more on inner levels and hasn't fully played out. And it's the snowball effect is starting, but we could still shift the snowball enough so that we can avert things like nuclear war and, you know, complete destruction of the environment. This is what I'm hoping that as many of us as possible can work on in this next time window that we have until February of 2025, when the astrological influences are such that we can have a big effect on these inner levels before they completely play out. So that is how we can get at the root of the problem and thereby make a radical solution. And I think all of us are also feeling that the old paradigm isn't working anymore and it's falling apart, sort of like Atlantis, you know, falling apart and submerging under the sea while, you know, places like Hawaii and Iceland are coming up. Perhaps we can also, as we do these practices, tap into the whole ocean and begin to be conduits for a new paradigm, a new way of doing things and seeing things to come through. Uh, so I'm adding that little piece. I don't even know the Tibetan word for paradigm, but <laughs> it's something I've thought of a lot. Um, so I wanted to share with you excerpts uh, from Tukusangak Rinpoche's letter, and you can read the whole thing on the website as well. But I wanted to share a couple of you know pertinent pieces of it 
give you a chance to think about them. There'll be a Q&A at the end, but I also wanted to give you a chance to, you know, talk in small groups about, you know, what feels right to each of you to do in response to all this as you hear it. So I'm just going to launch right into some excerpts of his letter. Has also taught that these averting methods can be gathered into three primary ways, which are, in brief, one, building statues of Guru Rinpoche and taming of Mara stupas in all directions. Um, and instead of having to build great big stupas, what we've done is we've um, infused little figurines of stupas with precious substances and months worth of prayers and ceremony and so on. And they're in the shape, perfect replica of the stupas because uh, when it comes to sacred geometry, size doesn't matter, if you will. That's the first thing is um, the stupas. Two, reciting aloud the extensive spontaneous fulfillment of wishes or its condensed form, Dakbe Shing Chok Ma. And we have a recording of me chanting that. Um, so you can chant along with me as many times as you like. I will never get tired of it because you can just click on the recording. And that's also on the website. And the Vajra Guru Mantra, we need to rack up a whole lot of those, but fortunately it's very short. Um, and we're going to keep count of it. So if you keep tallying those up on our website and look at how many others are also tallying those up, I think we could all encourage each other. Um, and also there is one group that's, that has been reciting these and we want to launch more especially starting tonight. Another thing that can be done is um, uh, getting prayer flags. We have prayer flags that uh, Tuku Sangak Rinpoche had made, especially to the specifications uh, that Guru Rinpoche gave for averting the worst of the, you know, cataclysm that's sort of looming. Um, so uh, placing prayer flags of these prayers in the four directions and reciting aspirations and verses of auspiciousness upon them. Apply the glorious three, apply the glorious Vajra Kalaya's enlightened activities of suppression, burning, and casting out. He will be doing uh, the Vajra Kalaya ceremony that he's describing here in this country for a weekend retreat led by possibly the four, one of the foremost nuns of our uh, monastery in India. She's come here to this country and she's busily learning English, but she is already extremely well versed in the Dharma, has done not one but two three year retreats, and she was the Vajra master for the second one. Um, and Dorlop means Vajra master. So her name is Dorlop Chusong, and um, she will lead that. And I'll probably give a little orientation to start with, just in case you're not entirely familiar with um, the ceremony. But group practice is quite powerful because it's like the difference between regular light, where you know it's the, the waves going up and down sort of haphazardly, versus laser light, which is known as coherent light, because the waves go up and down together. So group practice has the power equivalent to laser light as opposed to regular light. So that's the difference between individual practice and group practice. This is why we encourage group practice so much and why of the three jewels that the Buddha set out uh, for Buddhism, it's Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Sangha being about the community. So group practice is terribly important for the chanting of the prayers, the mantras, and um, these ceremonies. There are also going to be more ceremonies in Asia, and those need some support because they're expensive to put on. People have to eat while they're happening. Also, many things are offered in the ceremonies. Um, people have to be housed and so on. And in Tibet, they don't have the resources to do that. At the monastery, of course, they could use the help and so on. And incidentally, you get positive karma for donating. You get positive karma for all of this. And 
The important thing too is that as we do this with the full intention that we're trying to help everybody, it empowers anything we do, all of the things on the list, and we ourselves benefit. So the best thing we can do and the first thing to do is we ourselves use these practices, which are brilliant methods for us to be able to kind of see through the fog and be a beacon ourselves and be able to tune into, it's almost like getting a channel changer and being able to tune into the whole ocean awareness and view, which imagine if we all did that, we could all turn everything around. And where can we start? if not ourselves. Once we start with ourselves, as I'm sure you know, we infect everybody around us with our points of view. And we know what's been happening with crowds of people kind of inciting each other to all kinds of terrible actions. But you can use that same principle the other way and use group practice and just your everyday interactions and touching um, you know, into people and uh, any little contact. And they've even measured if you're standing in the same room, people's heartbeat changes, their um, electromagnetic Hertz uh, reading changes just by being, and the brain as well, just by being next to somebody, not even touching them, not even speaking. So there are a lot of things we can do on all these levels. Although I know I'm sharing some pretty dire news, I'm also sharing his prescriptions for solutions. And I want to go back to a little dire news. Um, Chadre Chadro Sanjay Dorje, known as Chadro Rinpoche, who was a, a famous, amazing, accomplished Lama, who I actually had the chance to meet and was a friend of Tukusangak Rinpoche's, he lived to be a very ripe old age. He um, gave a little bit of an interpretation of these predictions. So uh, Tukusang Rinpoche quotes him. Because the signs are increasing day by day of the coming of a danger which has never previously occurred, but could come quickly, of the use of nuclear weapons, which have the power to instantly destroy all of the teachings of the victorious ones the life force of beings and all the goodness of the environment and of living beings in this world, the kind of violent warfare which could kill all of humanity. Therefore, being urged to action by intolerable sadness and intense fear, then just like a child calling its mother, or as the saying goes, remembering Orjun Bema, that's uh, Guru Rinpoche, only when one reaches the treacherous mountain pass and not when unfavorable comfortable plains, unquote. In this time, we should all recite this prayer to invoke the enlightened minds of the ocean of jewels who are our objects of refuge. We should also write it on flags and hang them on the peaks of mountains, from bridges, and so forth. I believe this is necessary and carries immense benefits, so anyone who believes in me should keep this in mind. Then Tukusang Akrimpache goes on to state, what was stated here is something worthy of being implemented by the masses. And because it is easy to do, I request you to make efforts in doing so. So Rinpoche finishes by saying, also in um, Dujun Lingpa's prophecies, he states, quote, the spread of the doctrine of the barbarians will occur in the year of the dog. That's 2030. Apply the antidotal averting rituals in the year of the dragon. That's basically 2024. Uh, starting February 2024 to February 25, to be exact. Not just one Dharma center, but all of them must carry this out. Tukusang Rinpoche continues, as stated here, I feel that not merely one or two Dharma centers, villages or people, but all must not fall into carelessness and must implement these methods at once before the time mentioned in the prophecies has passed. Therefore, I request that you earnestly take this to heart. So in talking about the timing, I want to explain a little bit about what's meant here. In the year of the dragon, the astrological influences are such that we 
sort of have the tide going with us, astrologically speaking, to mix metaphors, so that we can make the most use of these tools to have the best effect for really turning around the headlong dash <laughs> off the cliff uh, that is motivated by self-interest and uh, ego clinging. Um, after February of 2025, 20, we won't have the sort of wind at our backs uh, quite as much uh, in making these changes, but that's no reason to stop, right? We want to do as much as we can right up until the year of the dog 2030 so that we can have um, as much effect as possible and just keep trying. But obviously this is um, a critical year that we're talking about because we can have the most effect now and we need the most effect, right? Especially since we ourselves are kind of stumbling in the dark, right? We can all feel that. I certainly can. I feel like, you know, I'm see, trying to see through the fog and, you know, the sleep, my own sleepiness and falling back into ego orientation and that kind of thing. And yet I know I want to be as much of a beacon in that fog as possible. So, uh, or in the darkness, if you will, as possible. The interesting thing is that darkness can't penetrate light, but even one candle can penetrate the darkness. So that's a little note of hope. And we can do this together. That's why I decided to name that website SEOT, Saving Each Other Together. It's the only way it's going to work. So I wanted to bring everybody together tonight um, so that I could help you um, learn about some of these things, consider them together, and pick a beginning of a plan of action after you brainstorm. <laughs> um, so pick a plan of action. And you know if you end up starting in one direction and deciding, well, you know now I, I feel like this is the next thing I want to do, that's fine. Um, but I suggest that you do it both um, in your own life and together. So, you know, you could be hanging prayers, uh, prayer flags, uh, doing prayers on your own, doing them together, and so on. And please remember always bringing full intention, just as we began this session, tuning in to that whole ocean awareness, so that quite naturally then, you want to help all beings. And that infuses whatever you do. So now what we'll do is to break into groups to spend just 30 seconds describing, well, just how do I feel? You know, I've just heard all this. What is my response to this? Distill the ideas. Okay, what really for me is something I want to sign up to do? Maybe the four of you decide, hey, we'd like to meet, you know, Sundays at 10. I'm inspired. I'm inspired by everything everybody's been saying um, and really touched. Um, this has been something I've been carrying with me, well, since I was 15. And more uh, specifically in the last few years. So I just am so deeply appreciative that everybody came and, you know, has been willing to listen to everything because I talked for a while <laughs> in the beginning and then, you know, talking with each other and um, brainstorming with each other and bringing each of your talents again, you know, sort of uh, the unique waveness that you are bringing them the power of the ocean through in your unique way is just beautiful for me to see. And I'm sure we all uh, feel that way about each other. And what you were saying, Donnie, about uh, the the loneliness and 
narrowness of when we just see ourselves as this one little wave on the ocean and we feel so helpless and any wave is going to you know come along and you know mess us up and so we're afraid of everybody and afraid of dying which is like going back into the ocean um uh, but we don't even understand that that we're also the ocean already anything we can do to help ourselves and each other to expand beyond that you know or you know deepen and expand i would say from the tip of the wave point of view this one little wave to the whole ocean this wave and all of the waves this i think is to the point uh, this is the task uh, at hand always for us sentient beings right but especially now it's crucial and everybody is depending on us because we've heard about this and we have the ability to do something so we're kind of on the front lines so let's do our best to help each other be as awake as we can and to infect everybody else with as much awakeness as we can muster we have some excellent tools and you know we also have our creative minds as we've seen tonight so we'll bring all of that to bear and we'll get together again and again uh in the groups that um you know whatever works for you on your time zone and in your life uh, and also just in your home by yourself as well so all of the things and i hope i see you all again soon i've really enjoyed um sharing this with you it's meant a lot to me and, and when i say enjoyed it sounds kind of funny because it's such a deep heavy subject but i have i feel deep joy in sharing this with you so now let's um, take a moment to dedicate the virtue, the merit of what we've just done here tonight and our uh, intentions that we've stated and so on by once again really tuning in through our hearts to each other, to the whole ocean, to all of our fellow waves on the ocean. And we send out our fervent wish and our intention that we help each other to wake up as much as possible, especially in this next few years if we all had perfect vision of how reality really is then I believe we could make heaven on earth so we're going to fall short of that but may we reach for that as much as possible and attain, attain as much as possible Think of all of the masters, including Guru Rinpoche, Tripu Sangak Rinpoche, and many of the others who have made it possible for us to be on the front lines. And with that, again, I thank you all for attending. Take care, everyone. Be well.